That is such a fun song to sing. Woo! Gets you up and moving. Good morning, good morning. I'm Reverend C.C. Coltrane, and welcome to Center for Spiritual Living, Greater Dayton. If you're here for the first time, a special welcome, and thanks for spending your morning with us. If you want us to be able to tell you about events and things that are coming up, workshops, special guest speakers, parties, uh, dances, um, hikes, what, all the other things, there is on your bulletin cover a little tear-off strip that you can fill out, and that will let us stay in touch with you. You can take it over to the Welcome Center after the service or just put it in the offering basket when, when it comes around. Uh, also, there is a Wednesday, most of the time Wednesday this week. I didn't do it till Friday. Bad. <laughs> Usually on Wednesday, I send out a little midweek pick-me-up spiritual message, so if you'd like to receive that. You can put your email on that form and, like I say, either at the Welcome Center or in the offering basket when it comes around. Our pulpit assistant this morning is Linda Andriaco. Our vigil holder is Jerry Blumgold. And Lana Mayhew and Linda Smith will do our interfaith candle lighting, which we do because we respect and honor and draw from the wisdom of all of the world's religious and spiritual traditions the way that our founder, Ernest Holmes, did. Our mission here at Center for Spiritual Living, is to help people wake up to their spiritual magnificence. We believe that if everybody knew how magnificent and essential they were to the universe, if, they, if everyone knew that every single one of us is magnificent and essential, the world would be a very different place. So our mission is to help people wake up to that. And during 2017, <coughs> we approached that mission by creating a greater sense of community among ourselves and, and with the outside community by opening ourselves up to those new relationships and the wisdom that comes from those relationships and, and by learning how to really live from our spiritual magnificence in community, which is where, you know, we um, rub shoulders with each other and we find out all those sharp corners that need to be knocked off and all those wonderful things. And we do it with love and that changes everything. That changes everything. So, kids, welcome to you. Let's see if our teachers will stand up so they can be found over there. We have John with the 6 to 11. No, teens and tweens. Teens and tweens. Kathy is with the 6 to 11 or little? Little with the, with the, uh, the, the under, 5 and under. And Carol is with the 6 to 11 group. So we're, what we're going to do right now is sing a song to our kids. Most men, If you've been here before, you might know it. It's called You Are. Um, if not, and you have a music book, it's page 61. And then at the end of that song, the kids can head back to class with their teachers, and we will get on with the service out here. We're so glad you're here, kids. Let us sing to you. We love you. Christianity, 
Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. We light this candle in honor of Islam. Unity is written on the tablet of your heart. You should continue studying that tablet for eternity. You should have spent a lifetime reading scriptures and consumed yourself in this pursuit of ignorance. You only have a remembrance, the one word of God, and keep on practicing that one word. We light this candle in honor of the Sikh religion, God, the helper of the helpless, the strength of the weak, the supporter of the fallen, the true father of all. Forgive us, O Lord, all our faults. Extend your helping hand to everyone. Grant us the company of those who may help keep your name fresh in our hearts. We light this candle in honor of Buddhism. The only real failure in life is not to be true to the best one knows. We light this candle in honor of the Native American religions. When you know who you are, when your mission is clear and you're burned with the inner fire of unbreakable will, no cold can touch your heart. No deluge can dampen your purpose. You know that you are alive. We light this candle in honor of Hinduism. Always aim at complete harmony of thought and word and deed. Always aim at purifying your thoughts and everything will be well. We light this final candle in honor of Judaism. Who is wise? One who learns from every man. Who is strong? One who overpowers his inclinations. Who is rich? One who is satisfied with his lot. Who is honorable? One who honors his fellows. Today's reading is from The Thing Itself by Ernest Holmes. We are told to be renewed in mind by the Spirit and to put on the new person which is created in true holiness. The mind is the creative factor within us, and when the mind takes its pattern after the Spirit, it automatically renews the outer person after true holiness or wholeness. Whatever the mind holds to and firmly believes in forms a new pattern of thought within its creative mold, as whatever thought is held in the mind tends to take outward form in new creations. This is the secret and the whole secret of the creative law of mind. Let us take these words into the silence for a couple of moments, please. God is creation. God is visible in everything that we see in the gorgeous sunshine this morning. Even in the cold, the snow is sparkling with the diamonds as the sun reflects off of it. And in the soft sounds that the snow hushes, God is there. God is with each and every one of us. We are part of God. We are part of creation. We are love and we are peace and harmony and shining speckles in the creation of this universe. I am thankful for this time. I am thankful for everyone participating, the children's ministry, the music ministry, everyone who braved the cold to be here today. And I am thankful and I say, and so it is.
<laughs> Whenever we change the order, I get confused. I'm not quite sure when I'm supposed to be up here. So, now I guess. <laughs> So as I said uh, earlier, during 2017, um, actually maybe I didn't say this, we're exploring what it means to live according to our highest and truest spiritual values. Um, we, meaning the ministers around the globe who sort of put this whole year's plan together for all of Centers for Spiritual Living, decided that it might be a good idea to start with some of the foundational ideas of our philosophy the framework on which we hang our spiritual values. And the first foundational idea, of course, is what is this thing we call God, spirit, universe, whatever you call it, whatever, whatever that creative impulse that, that caused everything to come into, into being. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, called it the thing itself. Um, and we'll talk about why in a minute. Um, you know, there is no culture in human history that didn't have some form, that we know of, it, that's recorded anything, that didn't have some form of religious or spiritual expression. Um, the earliest, the very, very earliest was um, 40,000 years ago, someone made a little statue of a creature that was half man and half cave lion. Now, cave lions are, have been extinct for 12,000 years. But that was the earliest, 40,000 years ago, the earliest statue of a god that we know of. <coughs> There's no culture that hasn't had some form of religion. And by religion, I mean a, a, a system, some sort of system of beliefs and practices that were either revolving around or leading to a transcend, transcendent spiritual experience of some sort. And, and so 40,000 years ago and before, we had people trying to put form to something that's formless, an explanation to something that is inexplicable and mysterious. And today we have neurotheologists, believe it or not, uh, uh, who are <coughs> neurobiologists who say we are hardwired to seek spiritual connection. We're hardwired to believe in something greater than we are, in the very structure of our brains. We've always sensed, since we became human, that there's something beyond what we see and know and we want to understand it better. So we've tried. We've tried to know and understand the being or power or energy or life that is larger than we are and that we somehow sense that's all around us. And early religions kind of gave God um, gods roles that they were specific to. There'd be an entity that had a, a, a role in creating and maintaining the cosmos and the earth, like the god of sun or the god of rain or the god of wind or the god of crops, the gods of hunting success. The, 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 and, and the entities were most often human-like, anthropomorphic. They looked like us and behaved sometimes in ways that mirrored the values of the culture, as they did in Egypt, and sometimes they didn't, <laughs> like in Greece. Some of the Greek gods did some really strange things. Um, and, and those were the stories that were told about them. And, and, and in some areas, each god figure was thought to represent a face or facet of something that was so large we couldn't wrap our heads around it. Like in Hinduism, you have a god who removes obstacles, and you have a goddess of destruction and, and uh, of actually circulation, birth and death, and 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 all of that. You know, you have all these faces of a single entity, because one face is not enough, is it, to illustrate the allness of this whatever it is that you want to call, whatever you want to call it, God, spirit, the universe, the creative impulse, whatever it is. And of course, much later, the monotheistic religions, Christianity and Judaism and Islam arose, and they said there was only one God, but we still haven't been able to agree on the characteristics of that God, have we? 
we're still arguing about it. <laughs> because every, in history, every culture has created a God that looked like it. A God in its own image. In 500 BCE, a Greek philosopher named Xenophes of Colophon wrote this. He said, mortals suppose that the gods are born and have clothes and voices and shapes like their own. But if oxen, horses, and lions had hands, or could paint with their hands and fashion works as men do, horses would paint horse-like images of God. And oxen, oxen-like ones, and would fashion bodies like their own. The Ethiopians considered the gods flat-nosed and black, the Thracians blue-eyed and red-haired. We have always had gods that looked like we did. And in Genesis, we're told that Adam and Eve are created in the image and likeness of God, meaning like large, super powerful human beings residing somewhere out there, controlling somehow everything that's happening. And in the West, we see pictures of God as blue-eyed and fair-skinned. And in the Middle East, we see pictures of God as olive-skinned and dark-haired. And in, in indig indigenous Australia, God is black-skinned, with dark hair, and so on and so on. We've always had this desire to try to make a picture we could understand of this power of the universe. And so we did that for tens of thousands of years in all of these religions since time immemorial. There's always been some sort of religious or spiritual system, and then, then along came science. And science told us some amazing things, like the Earth is not the center of the universe, nor is it flat. Science taught us that the whole world is still evolving, and in fact, so are we, and that the universe is a weird and wonderful place that's ruled by quantum processes that we can't even, that would just sort of baffle us. Weird science, you know? Uh, spooky, spooky action at a distance. Things, those are the terms the scientists give it, right? Science taught us that everything in the universe began in a singularity that we call popularly the Big Bang. Science taught us that life on Earth has developed through this process of natural selection and evolution, in fact, is still going on, and we are still in the middle of it. And, and, and there's so much new stuff coming at us all the time, like our attention to a process affects the outcome of that process. Who'd have thought? Right? The observer effect. Science is teaching us all sorts of mysterious things about the universe we live in. And somehow our ideas of God got frozen. What? When did Judaism, 5,000, 7,000 years old now, something like that? Um, our idea of God got frozen in the Old Testament kind of thing, even though all this other stuff is becoming apparent. But there's always been a group of people since we began to record the, the half-man, half-cave lion, who, who had a vast and powerful perspective on this mysterious thing we call the universe and its powers. And, and those people are called mystics. And the mystics of all, all of the ages have told us a couple of really important things. First, it is, first is that this thing called God is both imminent and transcendent, meaning it's right here where we are, and it's also infinite and mysterious and indescribable. Second is that God is everywhere, in everything. We can see it wherever we look if we try. It peeks through every life form, and it even exists in the space between one object and one person and another, the space between one subatomic particle and another. The, God is the ground of all being, as they say. Third, as the Quakers say, we are of God. The kingdom of heaven is within us. It's not over there. It's not over there. There, It's not above us or below. It's within us. 
I came across this wonderful quote from Joseph Campbell. He wrote a book called Thou Art That, which is a <coughs> wonderful little book. And, he, and, I, and I offer this quote not as a dismissal of scripture, because I read scripture from every religious tradition and find deep truths in all of them. I offer it as a perspective that's a bit larger, big enough to allow an enormous concept of God. I think he wrote this. He said, Faith in old-fashioned scripture or faith in the latest science belong equally at this time to those alone who as yet have no idea how mysterious, really, is the mystery of themselves. Into how many of us has the weight described by physicist Erwin Schrodinger been born that this life of yours, that you are living, is not merely a piece of the whole existence, but is, in a certain sense, the whole of the entire existence. Only the whole is not so constituted that it can be surveyed in a simple glance. This is what the Brahmins express in that sacred mystic formula that is yet really so simple and so clear. Tat Tvam Asi. That is you. You are that. Wow. We have no, those, those of us who have not contemplated really how mysterious is the mystery of ourselves and that we are the whole of existence in a glance. This is where we stand now in this evolving spiritually minded species that we belong to. We stand on the edge of moving into a sense of that weight of the mystery of knowing how mysterious the mystery of self really is. Of coming to realize that we are that and that is us. <coughs> and we at the West, we in the West come towards that mystery in the way we do most things, and that is very individualistically. We come at it one on one, one to one, all by ourselves sometimes. Um, there's a great story in a, in a French book. The English translation is The Quest for the Holy Grail. I can't pronounce the French, sorry. <laughs> the Quest for the Holy Grail. In this story, there is uh, the knights of, Sir, of King Arthur's round table are waiting for dinner to be served, but there was a rule, a tradition, the dinner, no meal, in fact, would ever be served until an adventure had arisen. So they're sitting around waiting for dinner, and all of a sudden, the grail appeared, covered with a cloth, and hung in the air for a moment, and then disappeared. That meant they could have dinner, but it also spurred King Arthur's nephew, Gawain, to say this, I propose that we all now set forth in quest to behold that grail unveiled, uncovered. Everyone agreed but they thought it would be disgraceful if they all set out together. So each one of them went to the woods and chose a pl place where there was no path, where it was darkest, and that's where that individual set out. So they each set out from a different, very dark place where there was no path. Doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> the individual search for God. I think I'll go to the dark forest and look for a place where no one has walked before, and then I will go. That's what we do. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, also came at the mystery in a typically Western fashion. He tried to find the common ground of all the religious traditions, all the, the golden thread of truth that ran through them all, and then he tried to make it practical, because we love practicality and we love individuality in the West. So we have been called practical mysticism, the pathless path, practical spirituality, all those kinds of things because Holmes wanted to know how this idea could be not just something we talk about on Sundays, but something that we live all the time. He also knew that God couldn't be a he or a she because that was a limit on the mystery. It, it's not really an it either, but when you try to describe something indescribable, you always run into trouble with the language <coughs> you use to describe it, right? <laughs> So he said, he called it the thing itself. So it's not really a thing, it's just indescribable. 
Holmes himself said this, it's simple enough to come to believe that whatever you call it, there is only one power in the universe. There is only one presence. There is only one final law. It is good. It is love. We call it God. It is where we are. We are in it. Since it is present everywhere, it is in us. It is the same God, God incarnated in me. There is one life. That life is God. That life is my life. Therefore, in me is the power. Now, I am not the power, but in me is the power. The same power that sets the stars in their courses and says to the wave, thus far and no farther. Within me. And, of course, within you, within each of us is this power. And I think what we have evolved to is the point of recognizing its presence. The kingdom of heaven is within, not out there somewhere, but within. And we continue to evolve, and as Dr. Holmes says, we will continue to evolve eternally. We are eternal beings now, and there's something <coughs> in us right now that will be farther along in the future than we are now. So Holmes looked at the commonalities among all the ways of thinking and being that the mystics of Hinduism and Islam and Christianity and Jainism and Sikhism and Buddhism and all of those religious traditions offered. The things that the mystics said, practice these things and you will come into a greater awareness of that which you are. Prayer, common to all of those religious spiritual and spiritual traditions. Meditation or contemplation, common to them all. Affirmation to help us grow our faith. And the most important, of course, love. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And I don't think he meant be polite to your neighbor. I think he meant love your neighbor. He meant, I think he meant see the mystery that your neighbor is and see the mystery that you are. The God that is in you is the God that is in me, and that is how I can talk to you. And the God in you will respond, and that is how you can talk to me. In the latter part of his life, <coughs> Ernest Holmes wrote a book called Ideas of Power, and he said this, We shall know God, we shall know each other in God, and we shall know God in each other. And as our thought of God reaches out to embrace the universe, our arms will be around each other. There is that in you that is wed to the universe, soul to soul, mind to mind, spirit to spirit, and it is forevermore holding you in its embrace. A love so infinite, deep, and broad that men have renamed it and called it God. That's what Holmes called the secret to life, is recognizing that there is a divine power and presence that surrounds us and dwells in us and that it works through us to create good, to create love, to create health, to create abundance, to create joy and peace. It works through us to create those things when we let it, whatever it is you want to call it, however it is you want to think about it. There is a force for good in the universe. That's what Ernest Holmes said. That is a very well-publicized secret, right? It's a, it stops being a secret and starts to become a transcendent mystery and an imminent reality when we start living it, when we start practicing it and actually living from it, when we start remembering every day that the power which thought the universe into being lives in us, we lose our fear. When we start remembering every single moment that the power that lives in us and through us is love, we lose hatred and anger and rage. When we start remembering always that we are the beloved of the universe, then loneliness and despair drop away. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul wrote, You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, <coughs> and to put on the new self, 
created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Don't let that word righteousness bother you. All it means is living according to one's values. <laughs> Made new in the attitude of our minds and putting off a new self, created to be like God in holiness. We again hear here that we're made in the image and likeness of God. Not that God is a big human being in the sky, but that we are holy and sacred beings. We call forth the good in the world by the attitude of our minds and hearts. Right? What we see tends to grow. What we focus on <coughs> tends to accumulate in our lives. When we look out with eyes of love, we see lots of love in the world. And Dr. Holmes said one more thing, which to me is one of the most important. He said, so I have looked for this golden thread, and I have found it, and I have laid it out in a way in which you can use it. And the last thing I want to say to you, he said right before he died, stay open at the top. Let new wisdom and information enter your worldview and your cosmology. Never stop evolving. Never stop evolving. I love that. This is where we stand, I think, as people in the world. Do we let the world, with its constant barrage of bad news, sometimes we do, do we let that drag us down? Do we let the insistent pressure to get more stuff and earn more money, do we let the pull of fear and desire take us? Do we let that have us? Or do we stand in the new self with a new mind, renewed by the spiritual practices that we teach and renewed by the support of a community of people, all of whom want to live their best life. That's the choice, that's the choice we make. Do we consciously take part in the evolution of everything or not? And I know what, my, what I want my answer to be. What I want my answer to be is that I never stop renewing my mind. That I want to be in the world but not of it. I, I want to remember always that what lives in the middle of my being is the power of love with a capital L. I want to remember that. I want to be forever making new my mind, my attitudes, my behavior, my words. I want to walk always on sacred ground. And my personal vow for 2017 is to start each day remembering that. So I invite you to join me in that. I invite you to join me in every day remembering that you are the beloved of the universe. Start each day remembering that all that you are is sacred and magnificent and essential to the universe. Start each day by remembering that the power of love is what woke you up this morning. I think if we begin to do that, we begin to change the world in very real ways. We begin to change the people around us simply by who we are. We begin to change our communities because we go out and do things, but we do them from this place of enormous love and of the God in us seeing the God in the other. We go out and do <coughs> things from a place of spiritual clarity, remembering that we are that, and that is us. So that is my invitation to you this year, in 2017, to simply start your day, even with that simple phrase, I am that, and that is me. Right now, let's just come together in consciousness, shall we? And as we just breathe, realize we are all breathing the same air. And that that air, the ground of being of that air is spirit. We are all standing on this planet. And the ground of being of the planet is spirit. We are hurtling through space in the middle of the Milky Way. In, in, as part of this infinite and expanding universe, the ground of being of the universe is spirit. God is the ground of all being. From the vastest reaches of space, 
to us and everything in between and everything around us in every moment of time. There's no place. God is not. And as we remember that, we just let it infiltrate our hearts and our minds, our souls, our bodies. We are all sacred, every bit of us. And everywhere we, we are is sacred ground. <coughs> and so what I know right now is that everyone who is here today is reminded by the still small voice within how wonderful, how beautiful, how capable, how magnificent, how beloved he or she is. That when there is doubt, there is a whisper, you are my beloved. That when there is fear, there is a memory that the power which put the stars in their places and the galaxies in their patterns and the planets in their orbits is right here where we are. That where there is unhappiness, there is again a still small voice that says, here I am and here you are, we are one. And so I know that knowing that, we say yes to the good that is available, that is always seeking us, the good, the joy, the peace, the health, the abundance, the well-being, the vibrant, vibrant life, the infinite love that is always seeking us. We say yes to it. We accept it. We open ourselves up to its flow and we say yes to it. And so I know for each one of us that 2017 is a year unlike any other as we find the courage, the joy, the peace, the love, the happiness, the wisdom to do all that we need to do with open <coughs> hearts and open minds filled up with the love of God. How grateful I am to know this. How grateful I am to be here in this moment of celebration of the truth of who we are. How grateful I am. So in gratitude, I simply let go I know that the universe that always does has already said yes. It is done. We let it be. And we say together, and, and so, so it is. It is. <laughs> I am just a thread, a simple thread in this glorious web of life. Drops within a stream flowing towards an ocean of light. We may forget where we come from. We may forget where we're going to. I might not see that you're a reflection of as much as I'm a reflection of you I am just a seed A blessed seed with eternity unfolding in me And I pray that as I grow Come from when I remember.
now have an opportunity to give to the center and its mission and its work. Your gifts and offerings allow us to be here on Sunday and to provide programs where our kids learn how to live according to their magnificence so that we can create an opportunity for everyone here to, to be part of a community that grows together as people of service and as people of deep spiritual practice. And all of that changes lives, like I say, because we walk out of here different people and we touch other people and inspire others to change and we all become happier and, and more productive and more contented as a result. So I just want to tell you, before we do our affirmation, that is, as soon as the offering is completed, the ushers are going to be passing around a gift to you. It is a journal with weekly readings and questions for you to ponder and write about <coughs> that goes through all of 2017. There's one reading and, and, um, and reflection per week it just, just to help you remember who you are day to day and to help you live your most radiant and full life. So we will pass that around as soon as we've finished with the collection. But right now let's affirm together. I am joyful. I am joyful. I am free. I am free. I am grateful. I am grateful. I give with gratitude. I give with gratitude. And I say yes. And I say yes to all the good life has to offer. <coughs> to all the good life has to offer. And so it is. And so it is. And so it is. Soup and salad. <laughs> In the Consciousness Cafe right after service. So I'll get through these quickly and then we'll eat. Um, let's see, in your bulletin is a reminder to refresh and renew your choice of Center for Spiritual Living for your Kroger Plus card or your Dorothy Lane Market reward card, so please make sure that you reconnect us. Um, this Saturday, if it is your lifelong ambition to put on every stitch of clothing you own <laughs> and go trudging into the, uh, uh, the uh, frozen tundra, if that is you... <laughs> Or the mud. If that is you, move to Alaska because that's not us. What is us is the polar hike. The polar hike is this Saturday. Um, let's see. It starts at 10.15 a.m. at the campground office of John Bryan State Park. Um, it is always very well attended. It's always a lot of fun. It seems kind of counterintuitive, but it's a really great way to spend a different kind of time with one another. For more information, you can see Gary if you'll... Gary right over here, or we have information up on uh, the boards behind the Welcome Center as well. <coughs> yes, we, there, there's, yeah, the reward is food afterwards. No. <laughs> the reward is the fellowship, really, but there is food, too. So. Clifton Mills. Yes, at Clifton Mills, where you'll be at a Clifton Mill restaurant. So, Let's see, this coming Sunday um, is Youth Ministry Volunteer Training and Potluck. So if you're part of the Youth Ministry or you think you might want to be, Please come to uh, the training that is after service next Sunday. Um, and again, please bring something to share. Uh, let's see. Please take a look at the calendar page of the bulletin and at the insert for more information on these and uh, a bunch of other great activities coming up. We have one terrific class, uh, Power of Your Word, taught by Miss Becky right over here on Monday evenings. That's starting next week, so um, go check that out as well. Um, back by the Welcome Center, we have the Change for Change drawer. Please don't forget about that. Empty your pockets and help make change here, right here in our community. Um, if you would like prayer after service, you can look for any of us wearing one of these. We are what are known as practitioners. For those of you that uh, have not been here before, we go through quite a bit of training, uh, a couple really scary tests, <laughs> in order to be able to pray with you and for you. Um, Okay, I ran through that. <laughs> this is our gift to you on Sunday. It's, we call it a one-minute miracle. There's all, uh, also a blue cards back in the back there um, that you can put into uh, the prayer chest if you would like. Um, so thank you to everybody who made this morning's service possible. The ushers and greeters, practitioners, the welcome team, of course the Higher Mind Band, <clears throat> youth ministry volunteers, and all of you. So if you'll please stand for our closing affirmation, and after that song, our after that, our closing song, which is We Are One. We certainly are. <laughs> Even if we're trudging across the tundra. Yeah, we're, wow. one of, we're one of something. Huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the power of love lives in me. The power of love lives in me. 
The power of life lives through me. The power of life lives through me. I am made new. I am made new. And so it is. And so it is.